Good morning, everyone who um, has joined us again for this fourth and last session of our program on digital activism, authoritarian adaptation uh, in the Middle East. Um, uh, well, I should say digital activism and authoritarian ad adaptation in the Middle East, because um, as you have heard, if you've been with us uh, since Tuesday of last week, there's a good bit of both, and they're uh, very uh, dynamically interacting with one another. Uh, we've looked at di digital activism, uh, we've looked at um, authoritarian abuses of these technologies, on Tuesday, uh, we consider how government is reshaping norms uh, regarding online activity in the Middle East. And we're going to close out today by looking at cross-border operations. I'm going to introduce our four speakers and papers in the order in which they're going to be speaking. They'll each have about 10 to 12 minutes to present the work they've been doing, and then we'll have a good discussion. Alexandra Siegel is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Colorado at Boulder. She's also a non-resident fellow at, the, at Brookings in the Center for Middle East Policy and the Arti Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technology Initiative. And her research uses original data sets of hundreds of millions of social media posts, text and network analysis and other methods to study mass and elite political behavior in the Arab world. Akin Unver is Associate Professor of International Relations at Kader Haas University uh, in Turkey, specializing in conflict research, computational methods, and digital crisis communication. He's a resident fellow of the Cyber Research Program at the Center for Economic and Foreign Policy Research and a research associate at the Center for Technology and Global Affairs at Oxford University. Shelby Grossman is our colleague here at Stanford, a research scholar at the Stanford Internet Observatory. She works on online political disinformation, the political economy of development in Africa. She has a forthcoming book uh, uh, that will be out soon with Cambridge University Press. I'm pleased to say she was a postdoctoral fellow at our Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law a few years ago. Uh, Renee DeResta, her co-author, is the technical research manager at the same Stanford Internet uh, Observatory, which is part of the Cyber Policy Center here at Stanford. She investigates the spread of malign narratives across social networks uh, and plays a prominent role in assisting policymakers to devise uh, policy responses. She studied influence operations and computational propaganda in the context of pseudoscience conspiracies, terrorist activity, and state-sponsored uh, information warfare. And <clears throat> she's kind of a go-to person for the Congress, the State Department, and many other actors in the public and private sector. Uh, Shelby and Renee have produced a paper together called Middle East Influ Influence Operations, Observations Across Social Media Takedown. So somewhat different than what we initially advertised. Finally, um, we'll hear from Nathan Gleitch, Nathaniel Gleitcher, who's the head of cybersecurity policy at Facebook. Nathaniel is an, both an engineer and a lawyer, so it's hard to imagine a better combination to talk about these issues. And obviously, he works at the intersection of technology policy and law. He's taught computer programming, he's built and secured computer networks. He's prosecuted cyber crime at the US Department of Justice. They could sure use you there right now, Nathaniel. And he served as director of cybersecurity policy at the National Security Council in the White House. Um, so Nathaniel will be speaking about covert manipulation, overt influence, direct exploit, understanding and countering influence operations in the Middle East and beyond. But first we'll go to our first two speakers, and I'll give you their titles now. Alexandra Siegel will be speaking on official foreign influence operations, transnational state media in the Arab online sphere. And Akin Unver will be speaking about Russian disinformation operations in Turkey uh, between 2015 and 2020. So Alexandra, uh, please, the floor is yours. <laughs> 
Great. Thank you so much, Larry, for having me and looking forward to all these wonderful presentations. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, can everybody see this okay? I'm just going to make it full screen here. Great. So as Larry mentioned today, I'm going to be talking about a type of influence operation which receives relatively less attention, both globally and in the Middle East in particular. I'm going to be talking about international broadcasters or state media outlets in the Arab online sphere. So what do I mean by international broadcasters? So international broadcasters are state funded media that are aimed at foreign publics. And these international broadcasters have increasingly targeted audiences in the Middle East and North Africa, working to shape narratives and to kind of advance their foreign policy goals. So some popular examples of these types of outlets, which I'm going to talk about today, are Russia's RT, China's CGTN, which was formerly known as CCTV, Al Alam, which is the Iranian broadcaster that targets audiences in Arabic, and TRT, which is a Turkish broadcaster. And all of these have Arabic language channels, both on mainstream media and online that target audiences in the Middle East, and they have quite large cross-platform online presence. So just to give you a sense of what the uh, follower counts of these outlets look like online in their online communication. So RT Arabic has about 15 million Facebook followers and over 5 million Twitter followers. Um, CGTN Arabic has about 16 million Facebook followers and just under a million Twitter followers. Al Alam has 6 million Facebook followers and about 15,000 Twitter followers. And then Turkish TRT Arabic has about 3 million Facebook followers and 1 million Twitter followers. So for those of you who might not be super familiar with these outlets, each of them has a kind of wide range of goals that they seek to accomplish in their content targeting the Arab world. So starting with RT, which is a global media empire. So Putin said of RT when it initially launched that its goal was to break the Anglo-Saxon monopoly on global media. In the Middle East in particular, um, we see a lot of Russian efforts to shape efforts surrounding the Russian intervention in Syria. Um, on the Chinese side with CGTN, um, some recent influence operations and um, kind of narrative efforts that we've seen um, are around COVID and trying to kind of blame the um, US for both um, kind of the initiation of COVID and its global spread. So we've seen a lot of narratives targeting um, Arabic speaking populations coming from China about COVID recently. Um, in terms of Al Alam, the Iranian network, it actually got started as a TV network in 2003 targeting Shia Arabs in Iraq, but it's expanded um, to kind of target Shia Arabs more broadly across the region and to advance Iranian foreign policy interests. TRT Arabic has been kind of dubbed a neo-Ottoman channel, which like Al Alam is trying to advance um, foreign policy and um, kind of operations in the Arab world, specifically presenting Turkish um, foreign policy interests. So why should we care about this? Why should we care about these international broadcasters in the online sphere? So first, as I just mentioned, they have very large online followings across platforms. And especially in contexts where trust in mainstream media is low, they present themselves as these alternative news sources, which are giving kind of truer um, interpretations of ongoing events. Indeed, RT's uh, kind of tagline, both in English and in Arabic, is question more. And the kind of motivation behind it is that RT is questioning mainstream accepted facts in the news and presenting what they call kind of truthful interpretations of events. Um, in recent work with Megan Metzger, we found that around key political events, these international broadcasters often receive even more engagement online than mainstream news outlets, both in English and in Arabic. In this particular work, we were looking at Russian um, 
operations with RT surrounding the Russian intervention in Syria. And similarly, these international broadcasters push state narratives that we then see being adopted by other news outlets and influential social media users advancing their narratives to wide audiences. So recognizing the potential negative consequences of these international broadcasters with large online presence, we've seen social media platforms beginning in 2018 with YouTube and more recently in 2020 with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram applying these state media labels to these accounts. So here are some examples from RT Arabic and because my Facebook account is sent to English. Here it says Russia's state controlled media, but you can see in the Twitter label, this also says Russian state controlled media, except in Arabic. So by adding these labels to platforms, the goal was to somehow reduce their influence and give people more awareness um, of the fact that these accounts are these state backed um, media outlets. However, these labels have been applied really inconsistently, and this is partly because defining what a state media outlet is, is somewhat difficult task, but also there are particular exemptions. For example, um, if the media outlet is deemed by the platforms to have sufficient editorial independence, it won't be labeled. But so what this means in practice is that accounts like RT and Chinese state media have been labeled, but Turkish and Iranian state media accounts have not been labeled by the platforms. And there's even some inconsistency across platforms. For example, Press TV, which is an English language um, channel, has been labeled by YouTube and Facebook, but not by Twitter. So one of the things that I look at in this paper is what was the effect of these platform labels? Do we see fewer followers and less engagement with these platforms after the labels were applied? So I collected a data set of about 700,000 tweets from each of these um, international broadcasters. I also used the internet archive to access historical counts of their Twitter followers to see how those change over time. And then using CrowdTangle, I collected about 500,000 Facebook posts from the outlet. So this allows me to look at follower counts and engagement levels um, across the outlets. And because RT and CGTN have been labeled as state controlled media while TRT and Al Alam have not, we can see some variation in labeled versus unlabeled platforms. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you the Twitter data here, although the Facebook data is in the paper as well. Um, so when we look at the change in follower counts for labeled accounts. And these um, plots here show every time the Internet Archive backed up the profiles of these accounts. So these are the times where we can see what the follower accounts were, but we can't collect them as consistently over time as we can with Facebook data, which um, labels the follower accounts each time the data is collected. Um, so what we see in these plots is the black line represents the platform labeling date. And we see that there's kind of a leveling off in followers after the platforms are labeled. There's not a clear drop in follower accounts, but it does seem to um, level off for the period after the platform labels were initiated. As more time passes since the labels were only done for Twitter in the summer of 2020, we can see if this changes over time, but this is the data up until uh, the start of May. Um, when we look at unlabeled accounts, on the other hand, we can see that following the black line, which marks the date the accounts were labeled, follower accounts continue to grow. So this provides some preliminary evidence that follower accounts seem to level off for the labeled accounts, but continue to grow for those that are unlabeled. Turning to engagement over time here, the red line represents the um, date at which platform labels appeared. What's interesting when we look at Chinese state media at CGTN Arabic is it looks like engagement dropped off quite a bit before the official announcement of the labels. I, often the platforms play around with initiating these labels for some users, for, but not for others. So it's possible that they started labeling earlier, even though the official label announcement didn't come until August of 2020 for Twitter. When we look at RT Arabic, we see a drop off in engagement um, pretty much immediately following the announcement of the platform labels.
when we look at unlabeled accounts we see for Al Alam, the Iranian outlet, that engagement continues to grow in the aftermath of the labeling of the account. And for the Turkish international broadcaster, it continues to grow and then drops off a bit later. I don't have a sense yet from this preliminary analysis of what's driving that later drop off. So just to summarize the preliminary findings here, so international broadcasters are increasingly popular online. We see this both in the Arab world and globally. Past work has shown that they can effectively shape narratives, particularly around key political events. These platform labels have been initiated, although inconsistently, with the goal of stopping or limiting the influence of these broadcasters and being more transparent about what these media sources are. But little is known publicly, although I'm sure the platforms know much more about the impact of these labels. So this preliminary analysis was designed to help give us some evidence about what role the labeling might be playing. And I think there, this preliminarily shows that labels may slow growth and engagement, although I'd like to expand this to look at a wider set of um, outlets globally to get a better sense of this. So thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions. Great. Wow. Uh, 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 Alexandra, that was just an absolute model of lucidity and organization, but also of fidelity to our, our time goal. So thank you so much for getting us started. Okay, next we have uh, Akan Unver. Uh, Akan, the floor is yours. Yep, thank you very much. Let me just put this on here. Let me start. So um, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my presentation will be on uh, the Russian information ecosystem, disinformation or information uh, manipulation ecosystem in Turkey um, for a five-year period. Of course, this is um, quite a large project that we started in 2017, uh, but every single year we were able to, you know, secure additional funding. So this became um, a lengthy issue. Um, the question is, you know, why care about Russian disinformation or information operations in Turkey? Um, this project started as um, a wider project on uh, how disinformation works in um, strategic um, insulator or buffer countries, countries that exist in between multiple um, security communities and security identities, such as you know Finland, Poland, Ukraine, Turkey. So it's basically those strategic buffer countries, you know, th that are basically open to um, tons of um, manipulation, and especially Turkish information ecosystem is very crowded with um, you know, foreign information operations and framing operations um, specific, not just Russian, but um, American, Canadian, German, British, um, Arabic, Chinese, Russian. So it's basically pushed and pulled in tons of different dimensions. So this basically looked at, it looks at it from your one single perspective, you know, what's Russia um, doing in Turkey. Um, and without um, actually delaying things, I'm just going to um, give you a sense of what our project has been doing. Um, Turkey is one of the most uh, disinformation heavy information ecosystems in the world, both domestically and in terms of international um, scene. Um, so we basically picked some benchmarks um, that form important events between uh, Turkey and Russia. And we um, have picked the S-400 you know, missile negotiations that includes five temporal benchmarks and it's a longitudinal study. Um, these are enormous um, data sets um, that uh, contain a lot of um, tweets um, on you know, uh, you know, Turkish, uh, Russia uh, relations. We have the 2016 coup attempt. We you know, wanted to see whether um, Russia has engaged in any disinformation during the coup attempt, assassination of the Russian ambassador in Ankara, a huge event, um, the downing of the Russian jets in uh, Syria, you know, by Turkish jets. So very, very important geopolitical events. We also have discarded cases um, that have a very high percentage of, um, you know, dirty data. Dirty data meaning um, basically it's so much plagued with, you know, either advertisements or um, 
it, it's it's a strange dynamic, but Korean pop bands use a lot of local hashtags in order to basically make themselves popular, but they also distort uh, our analysis um, hashtags to a great degree. So we basically selected cases that gave, give us you know, both large data sets, but also comparatively um, less corrupted um, hashtag data sets um, as well. Um, and we basically explored these on a case by case uh, basis. We also looked at robustness checks. So one of the main issues of how Russian disinformation is framed internationally is whether they do election manipulation in Europe, in the United States. So we looked at whether Russia does any uh, election manipulation in Turkey by looking at the 2018 um, elections. So, um, of course, every single case um, could be um, a presentation in its own right, because these are huge data sets and they're quite interesting uh, issues. But most important thing and most interesting thing about studying Russian disinformation in general, especially in a place like Turkey, where there are other disinformation attempts as well, uh, is that everything is very context specific. So uh, it's very important to understand the context, the political context and the social context in order to fully understand what Russia is up to uh, in Turkey. And I'm not really talking about language or like knowing Turkish uh, or not, but it's also knowing the Turkish cultural and political context in order to really understand what's happening. What we have here uh, are when Turkey shoots down the Russian jet, we basically see the emergence of four uh, narratives, what we call narrative A, narrative B, narrative C, and narrative D. We do um, LDA, basically, you know, to text modeling, text analysis um, out of those. Um, and we basically follow an LDA model, topic modeling, um, in which um, certain narratives have certain keywords associated with them. And those associated keywords uh, exist in specific media clusters or media networks. So for example, narrative B, um, without really knowing too much Turkish, you immediately see Sputnik and RT emerging here. Here we have a pro-Russian domestic Turkish uh, account as well. Uh, here you also see the dominant Sputnik um, news as well. What these are is that when Turkey shoots down the Russian jet, two primary narratives emerge. One. Turkey shooting down the Russian jet was justified, but no, Turkey shooting down the Russian jet wasn't justified and it was outside Turkish airspace. Then we have two additional um, clusters. One, uh, it's not important whether Turkey shoot down the Russian jet or not, whether it was correct or not. Turkey buys oil from ISIS and let's forget about the you know, shooting down incident. Let's focus instead on um, the oil issue and Sputnik here is the most uh, you know, high level disseminator of that narrative. And Turkish narrative, uh, it's very difficult to explain it without uh, giving you, you know, a deep down understanding of Turkish political context, but it's mostly about it wasn't the government, it was rogue you know, figures in the government that did uh, the shooting down incident. And when we do um, a temporal analysis out of this, um, first, narrative A, meaning Turkey was right in shooting down the Russian jet, it was popular, then it basically in a month it becomes less popular, where narrative C, you know, um, the Russian narrative that, you know, Turkey um, was not justified or unjustified in shooting down the jet, you know, instead look at Turkey's oil trade um, in Syria, that becomes the primary narrative until Turkey finds another fourth narrative, narrative D, which becomes popular by July, meaning that, you know, it wasn't us, it was a rogue group uh, in the government that um, shoot down the jet. And afterwards, the whole, at least like Russian origin, you know, Syria oil trade narrative completely disappears, then um, the rest of the world picks up. Now, the other question is, were there any Russian disinformation attempts during the coup attempt? And in order to explore that. That's a very difficult um, issue to explore. We looked at some of um, the most shared disinformation um, types and forms uh, during the coup attempt and tried to see whether there was any Russian influence in that. Um, these may look strange, but in a crisis like this, very really strange disinformation types uh, emerge. So this one was about, um, you know, people uh, throwing stuff at, you know, 
F-16 jets that are flying very low and, you know, trying to, you know, shoot them down uh, by throwing them, you know, shoes and stuff. But of course, this is, uh, you know, Photoshop, so it's a manipulated image. But when we look at um, uh, the dissemination cluster of that uh, disinformation attempt, we have very distinct pro-government clusters and nationalist clusters, and we don't really observe any Russian origin or Russia-affiliated information operations there. Um, the second um, most widely shared disinformation during the coup attempt was um, the, uh, you know, fake Azerbaijan incursion into Turkey. The narrative was that Azerbaijani troops are, you know, uh, threading into Turkish territory in order to help government resist against the coup attempt. So this was a very strange and here we don't really also see much Russian influence. We have a nationalist news network and a popular <clears throat> culture cluster that is disseminating this, but no um, Russian influence. Um, third most widely um, shared um, information operation was uh, soldiers that were killed during um, the coup attempt. Um, and you know they were basically sharing photos uh, of those, but this um, guy isn't dead. This is basically uh, a soldier photo that was taken elsewhere and shared as if it was uh, a photo um, of a dead soldier. Here we have opposition disinformation cluster, pro-government disinformation cluster, nationalist disinformation cluster, which gives you a sense of how you know, toxic Turkish information ecosystem already is without really necessitating external disinformation attempts. You know, Turkey already does a lot of disinformation on its own. And here we have a fact checking cluster, which can't really, um, you know, correct things as they come. Then case three, the assassination of the Russian ambassador in Ankara. And this is also very complex because uh, information operations here also include a lot of, you know, contextually important keywords um, and phrases. Um, but what we um, actually look uh, at this is that in the first few hours of the assassination of the Russian ambassador, um, let's see if the other graph has this. Yes, uh, what we have is a heavy bot retweet operation uh, of very negative sentiments clusters, meaning um, killing the Russian ambassador was correct. Ru Turkey shouldn't, um, you know, cooperate with Russia that much. Russia is bombarding Turkish supported rebels in northern Syria. So it was justified to kill the Russian ambassador. But then um, within the next uh, few hours, uh, a whole pro government networks, a network chips in, which is basically here um, and tries to reestablish the frame saying that no, the assassination was bad. Russian ambassador was uh, a friend and over time, uh, negative sentiment clusters here, you have a huge negative sentiment cluster saying that, you know, ambassador killing was justified, which immediately disappears soon after and generally it becomes a positive. Uh, here we don't really see that much Russian uh, information operation as well. Now the most fascinating part, which is uh, the first time that I did an extended longitudinal disinformation or you know information analysis. Um, it starts in 2016, goes up to uh, August 2018. Five benchmarks when Turkey and Russia uh, negotiated the S-400. Um, and here, to me, one of the most important issue is that during the first benchmark, we see a lot of negative uh, organic uh, retweet uh, activity, meaning that Turks were half and half divided between whether S-400s were good or whether S-400s were bad. Um, but gradually, when you see over time, the negative sentiment kind of slightly disappears and you know, positive sentiment kind of becomes um, more important, both in organic retweets and on bot uh, retweet count, meaning that gradually and over time, Turkish information ecosystem becomes pro S-400, although during the first uh, instance, it was mostly um, divided. And when we do a network analysis of you know, negative sentiment and positive sentiment clusters, we basically see a huge polarization initially, which later um, disappears. Um, but usually in this context, we have um, you know, Deutsche Welle and BBC and other um, you know, news actors that are very negatively anti S-400. 
and pro-government networks and Sputnik news um, that become positive as um, 400. So it gives you a general sentiment on the media uh, ecosystem of both positive and negative uh, clusters as well. So basically after, so we published a report on that and became you know, quite uh, popular and we started to do um, you know, further analysis into 2020, 2021, it's uh, preliminary results are published in the paper. But just to give you a general quick idea on this is that um, the majority of Russian information operations right now in Turkey are about Biden, you know, whether Biden is fit to become a president, whether Biden is lying or not lying. So that's right now number one. Um, the second most important issue between Turkey and Russia relations was the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, dispute between Azerbaijan and Armenia and Ukraine that are very, you know, very tense and high profile uh, military incidents between uh, Turkey and Russia. There's huge cautious uh, signaling without really criticizing Turkey, um, but also kind of trying to push the Russian narrative. And third, um, what the Russian information ecosystem is doing uh, is moderate levels of skepticism towards non-Sputnik vaccines, especially Pfizer. Uh, this means that uh, pro-Russian information ecosystem in Turkey doesn't really want uh, to create vaccine skepticism so that people are going to be also skeptical towards the Sputnik vaccine, but also um, they kind of have a nice view of the Sputnik vaccine, but um, great uncertainty towards other vaccines, you know, European and American uh, variants. So um, I'm basically saving the majority of the discussion to the discussion session. So I'll just stop here. This is a brief uh, explanation of what uh, my lab has been doing for the last um, three to four years. Um, and thank you very much. Great, thank you, Akin. That was uh, extremely interesting. You have a quite uh, an impressive data set there. So, um, uh, as I think I indicated, um, uh, Shelby Grossman will present the paper that she and uh, Renee Duresta have jointly contributed to uh, our conference. And then Renee uh, will join us in offering thoughts and answering questions in the Q&A session. So Shelby, over to you. Thanks. Thanks. So as Larry mentioned in the beginning, um, I'm going to be presenting on something different than what's in the agenda. So apologies about that. Um, I'm going to be talking about Middle East influence operations, observations across social media takedowns. So we basically created a data set of 148 influence operations that were suspended by Facebook and Twitter. And then we identified 47 of them, which originated in the Middle East and by our assessment targeted at least one country in the Middle East. That assessment was not always straightforward. So you could imagine you have a Saudi influence operation that is creating a lot of accounts pretending to be people in Yemen and posting a lot about, about Yemen. And so you might think, well, clearly the target is people in Yemen and maybe that's the case, but maybe the operation is actually trying to make people in other countries think that people in Yemen think a certain way. So this wasn't always straightforward, but we, we did our best. Um, and so we asked, you know, what have we learned from these influence operations? And I think the strength of the data set is that it covers, um, it provides insight about covert networks, which are otherwise difficult to, to learn about. The limitation of the data set is, of course, it's only what uh, the platforms found and disclosed, and specifically only what Facebook and Twitter found and disclosed as they're the only platforms that are making these disclosures in any meaningful way at the moment. And so just to give you some summary statistics, 20 of these operations originated in Iran, 10 in Egypt, six in the UAE, and five in Saudi Arabia. So this table is just showing the entity that these operations were attributed to. So 15 of the 47 operations were attributed to government-linked actors, and almost as many operations were attributed to marketing or PR firms. And this is a trend that is not specific to the Middle East. It's increasingly common for political disinformation campaigns to outsource implement implementation to these, these marketing firms. So what do we see in terms of, of goals? So one common goal is trying to promote 
national pride. So this is a post from a Facebook operation that was linked to the, the Saudi government. And you can see we have the crown prince uh, comforting someone in the hospital and the post translates to people around the world might wonder why do Saudis love the leaders they, the way they love their family. Simply it's because their leaders share the same feelings with them. Another common objective is to try to project a positive international image. And so you might be thinking, well, how do we know that, you know, that the international community is the target given the issues that I was just discussing? Um, and it, it's tricky, but for example, if you have like an Iranian influence operation that is posting exclusively in English, it's unlikely that the target of that operation is Iranians in Iran. Um, so some of the themes we see here, Iran tries to present itself as a champion of the oppressed, a leader of the Muslim world, a bulwark against neocolonialism and a stabilizing force in the region. Saudi Arabia really focuses on, on women's social progress. And the UAE often emphasizes how they successfully host all these international events like sporting events. Um, and then not surprisingly, a common narrative is trying to denigrate rival regimes. So there was a Facebook operation that was uh, linked to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and this is actually a, a Twitter account that was related to that network that's still live as of last night. Um, and so one part of this operation was to create um, a cluster of social media accounts called Never Neom. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So Neom is a planned city in Saudi Arabia. And these accounts tried to make it seem like this planned city was not actually going to benefit Saudi citizens. And more recently that it was like somehow part of a covert operation for Saudi Arabia to help Israel. Another example of denigrating rival regimes uh, comes from basically every single Saudi influence operation, which tries to um, malign the reputation of, of Qatar. Uh, so in one operation that we, we looked at, they had created these fake human rights watch and amnesty statements that were allegedly speaking out against torture in Qatar. Um, and then last, uh, it's, it's common to see particularly Saudi and UAE influence operations trying to undermine Qatar's relations with, um, with other countries, for example, Turkey, Iran, and the US. So this is a pretty emblematic cartoon showing the Qatari prince hanging on to a faltering airplane and holding the flags of his perceived rivals. Um, in terms of tactics, uh, we see a lot of, of astroturfing. So this is when you create an account that is pretending to be a totally ordinary citizen of a country who's just expressing opinions about certain political issues or, or politicians. So this is an astroturfing account pretending to be a Qatari citizen. And he's saying, I can't even post a, a photo of myself here because if I did, Qatar would, would jail me. This is another astroturfing account pretending to be a woman in Iran who is supportive of the anti-government protests in Iran that happened in 2019. Um, one tactic that we have been seen, we have seen used to impressive effect in the Middle East is is handle switching. So I think many people don't know, but you can actually change your handle on Twitter and retain all of your followers. So I could change my handle tomorrow from Shelby Grossman to Jen Smith, and I would keep all of my followers. And importantly, the URL for my Twitter handle would switch. So it would change from twitter.com slash Shelby Grossman to twitter.com slash Jen Smith. And this matters because it makes it really hard for people to put those URLs into archiving sites and see what the accounts were doing, you know, several years ago. And so we saw in a, um, a Saudi influence operation, they created many fake accounts that were pretending to be accounts for an interim government in Qatar. And actually, Mark Owen Jones helped to discover this network. Um, and so this is an account that's now suspended that is pretending to be the interim government of, of Qatar. And you can see that it was created in 2016 and it has almost 61,000 followers. So an ordinary Qatari citizen could be forgiven from thinking that this is actually the legitimate account for this, this interim Qatari government. But in fact, what this account did was it switched its handle repeatedly and it deleted all of its old tweets. So it's hard to know exactly how it got so many followers, but one possibility is that it engaged in like spammy follow back activity early in its life. So, you know, you follow me, I'll follow you, somehow got up to 61,000 followers, then deleted all of those tweets and changed its handle to, to CutterGov. So I think this is a, um, a kind of scary tactic that we should expect to be used going forward.
Um, and then finally, we see a lot of account masking. So you could imagine if um, you see a Twitter account that is only tweeting content critical of Jamal Khashoggi, you might get a little suspicious. You might even think that's a propaganda account. And so what we see actors doing is they'll just throw in a lot of fluff um, to try to mask the true intent of the account. So in one operation, we saw fluff that took the form of these like generic statements, like I really hate getting flashbacks from things I don't wanna remember. But we've also seen the use of automated uh, clients that will, Twitter clients that will automatically tweet verses of the Quran so that you'll see, you know, one tweet critical of Jamal Khashoggi and then 10 verses of the Quran. And you might, you know, think that it's actually an authentic account. And then last, I'll just conclude with what we don't see. This is a little bit of an exaggeration, but generally I think we don't see as many falsehoods as you would expect. So that's not to say that falsehoods aren't a problem. For example, with the uh, Qatar government account, that account existed to in part to spread the unfounded rumor that there had been a coup attempt in Qatar. So that's real and that's important, but the overwhelming majority of the, in the of content in these, these influence operations is either true or unfalsifiable. And it's still disinformation because these accounts are being deceptive about, about who they are, but I just think that's worth noting. Um, so I'll stop there, thanks. Well, once again, um, Shelby, uh, I'd like to thank you as well for just, um, beautiful uh, organization and clarity of presentation and discipline and sticking to our time limit. We're gonna have some good time for discussion. Now we go again, in case you were late in joining us on the bios to the head of cybersecurity policy at Facebook, uh, former uh, cybersecurity expert uh, at uh, the Department of Justice and the NSC, Nathaniel Gleicher. Nathaniel. Thanks, Larry. And uh, thanks everybody for the discussion so far this morning. I have the simultaneously enviable and unenviable role of going last in the cycle of conversation. It's interesting because I think it actually works reasonably well here, given what I want to talk mm -hmm. about. Um, because part of what I want to do is to put some structure around the different types of threats we see in this space. And it's interesting the way the different presentations so far have tackled different pieces of the influence operations challenge. Uh, in my role at Facebook, I'm our head of security policy. I coordinate our work across the company to tackle what we describe as adversarial threat actors. That is any type of individual or group that is systematically looking to misuse the platform and to misuse other platforms to sort of do the opposite of the goal of what a platform might be, right? If Facebook's goal is to build community, these actors' goal is to divide or to leverage the way that they can build anonymity and use other types of techniques to manipulate or influence public debate. What I wanted to do is I'll talk a little bit about structure, sort of three ways to think about the challenge. Then I wanted to talk about how we tackle some of these threats. And then the last is to offer some trends and insights we've seen about things that are happening both in the region and around the world. And um, as a sort of sourcing for a lot of my conversation today, just last week, we put out a threat report, which we called our 2017 to 2020 IO threat report which outlines what we've seen and the, the threats that we've seen around covert influence operations over the past three and a half years or so. And that report was accompanied by a data set of a, more than 150 of these takedowns that we've published, that we've published details on, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that works, um, including source country and origin country for each takedown, and then a link to a report that provides quite more extensive analysis of what we saw. Um, and so it's interesting actually to see as you look at that data set, you can see targeting across the Middle East, both from countries in the Middle East and from countries outside the Middle East. So if we take those three things in order, first sort of one way to think about this, we're talking about information operations or influence operations. I would say that sort of in that space, we should be thinking about three different types of adversarial threats, at least two of which have come up today already. The first is direct hacking or cyber espionage, efforts to directly exploit accounts, assets, and devices. And often these types of operations from our perspective don't directly target Facebook. They actually target the cell phones and devices of activists, dissidents, or figures within these regions. But then they'll use that compromise to also target their Facebook assets. So for example, in April, uh, we identified and removed two cyber espionage operations, both originating in Palestine, 
one that targeted people aligned with Fatah and the other that targeted people opposed to Fatah. And the goal of these operations was to trick people into downloading malware so that they could compromise their devices and facilitate surveillance of those devices. As I mentioned, <clears throat> this wasn't really targeting Facebook, but we were able to see some of their coordination, which meant that we were able to not just take them down, but also expose them publicly to sort of warn the victims or other people they might be targeting. Second type of threat are overt influence operations. And the first presentation was a very useful discussion of state media. And indeed in the second one, we saw quite a bit of this as well. These are efforts to influence or shift public debate, often linked to governments, where they are public about who is behind them and who is controlling them. The state media labels that we talked about in the first discussion are one way to make that um, allegiance more clear and to provide more context to the public so people can judge for themselves what's behind these operations. These are large and diffuse operations. We see them around the world. They are um, more legitimate in some sense because they are being public about who's behind them, but they are still very impactful. And the fact that they are public about who's behind them at once gives the public and viewers tools to understand who they're hearing from, but also makes them more legitimate, which makes countering these efforts much more challenging across um, public debate. And then the third category are covert influence operations. Uh, an example of this would be in March, we removed an operation run out of Egypt that was targeting Ethiopia, Sudan, and Turkey. It was a network of fake accounts and deceptive pages that posed as locals in the countries that they targeted, concealed the identity of who was controlling them and tried to make themselves look independent. And this was linked to an Egypt-based marketing firm named Be Interactive. And I'll get back to marketing firms in a minute, which shall be touched on and I do think is actually an important trend that we're seeing in this space. So we have these three types of threats, direct hacking, overt influence operations, and covert influence operations. I'm gonna focus on covert influence operations, but I'm happy to talk about the others during Q&A. And one of the reasons that I want to do that is covert influence operations are designed to take away the ability of the public to judge who's behind them. And it makes them hard to study and it makes them hard and it makes them particularly hard for the public to respond to or sort of protect themselves against. This is a space where I think platforms have particular responsibility and opportunity to have positive impact because based on our investigations, we can peel back the layers behind these covert operations and expose who is behind them and what they were trying to do. There's a lot of um, speculation about how this is done. And I will just say quickly, you have to have a combination of automated artificial intelligence based systems and expert investigation. There's a lot of focus on AI as a tool to tackle these challenges. And while it is useful, it's very far from a silver bullet. The way we think about this is that automated systems establish a floor. They create a, a barrier for threat actors, but we know that sophisticated threat actors are going to find ways around them. They operate at very large scale. For example, today we have automated systems that find and block millions of fake accounts every day, often within minutes of their creation. But we also know that a sophisticated threat actor will still find ways to create fake accounts. And so you use that together with a team of expert investigators. And the goal is to think of these two working together. Automation raises the floor and forces the threat actors to work harder and frankly, slow down. And that gives time for our expert teams to find and catch them. And that combination both cleans up the environment and helps contain the most sophisticated threat actors. And then each time we find a sophisticated operation, we observe the behaviors and we feed that back into the automated system. So that over time, you can imagine the floor created by automation going up and the experts being continually able to focus on sort of the newest and the most um, fast moving types of threats. When we do this, uh, we focus on what we call coordinated inauthentic behavior, which is a term that is defined in our community standards, is used pretty widely across the public as we talk about influence operations, often with slightly different meanings. Um, and so I will just say for coordinated inauthentic behavior from Facebook's perspective, it requires that the network be using and centrally relying on fake accounts. We created a very firm floor there so that we could say clearly what is CIB and what is not. Whenever we find a CIB operation, we announce it publicly. Whenever we take one down, we announce it publicly. So we've done more than 150 of these takedowns over the past three years. That is the data set that is the basis for the report that I mentioned. The reason we do that is really threefold. 
first, we want to inform the public about these operations, and in particular, inform uh, people who might be targeted by them so that they can judge for themselves. Second, we want to put pressure on the bad actors. This doesn't just mean calling them out, although there is a name and shame component to this, but it also means exposing the tactics that they're using so that other researchers and other experts around the community can find and expose them as well. One of the core lessons of countering influence operations that I've seen over the past several years is that you have to have government actors in countries that are focused on this challenge. You have to have civil society, researchers and experts like the speakers we have here, and you have to have the platforms all working to tackle the challenge from different dimensions. So part of our goal is to get as much of the information, the analytic information that is gonna be useful to expose this stuff out to the expert community. And then the last reason we do this is to build a public record of these operations, what has happened and what has taken place over time so that we can do these types of studies. Now, it's important to note, as I shift to talking about the threat report a little bit, there are some important limitations to this data set. This, and, and this links to some of what Shelby was talking about. These are the takedowns that we found. And I think it's always important to acknowledge that I don't think anyone can know the denominator here although we do see some useful trends in what's being caught to suggest that more and more of these are getting caught and that the trends are moving in a positive direction. I think it's also important to note that these are, take, that these are operations that touched Facebook. More and more, these operations are multi-platform and we have multiple times found operations that we've been able to take down, despite the fact that actually a small amount of what they were doing was on Facebook. But because we found that piece, we could share that with our counterparts at the other platforms and have a much broader impact in taking it down. But if you're seeing operations running in traditional media, running purely on the broader internet, which we are seeing more and more, our teams aren't gonna be focused on that and they're not necessarily gonna have additional insight. And then the last thing that's extremely important is that the data set is affected by where we look. If you look at the history of this data set, there's been huge focus on Russia and Iran as sources of influence operations. This data set bears that out. They are the two countries that are the largest sources of CIB around the world. Some of that is because given the public focus, given the way they've targeted, there's been a lot of resources devoting to, devoted to looking there. And so I think we have to be conscious of that. Nevertheless, I think it's a useful data set to look at. And there are some things about it that, that show the scope. So let me talk about that a little bit. Um, first, the data set covers more than 50 countries around the world and more than 30 languages. I think one point that has sort of come out in a couple of these conversations, but we haven't highlighted it, is that influence operations are global. There's a lot of targeting in countries outside of the US and Europe. And I think critical for this conversation, much of the IO global discussion and expert discussion is focused on targeting of the US and Europe, but much of the actual ball game that's happening in the innovation is happening outside of that in places like the Middle East. And so it's really important that there are that platforms and others have language skills to tackle these and cultural skills to understand the narratives that are getting driven. And it's also important to have investigative tools that don't rely purely on language so that when you're looking at behavior, you can take action even if these actors are moving across multiple languages and multiple platforms. Second, the operations are domestic and foreign. And I think this is a really important point that has sort of been called out here, but we haven't highlighted as much as I'd like. I think we often focus on foreign interference, but actually over the course of the years that we've been doing these takedowns since 2017, approximately half of the networks we've removed have been domestic in nature. And what I mean by that is these are operations being run from inside the same country where they're trying to influence public debate. We see this linked to political parties, to individual activists, certainly to marketing firms. And I think we're seeing, we're going to see more of that trend. So as much as it's important that we think about this in a geopolitical context and in a great power conflict context, I think it's easy to get distracted by that and to lose the fact that we're really seeing domestic actors use these techniques as well. The second point is, I think, very important to call out both government and non-government actors are involved here. And in fact, I think we see more growth in the non-government space than in the government space. Um, again, I think the marketing firms are a very good call out there. Within region, um, oh, sorry, that's my cat. She wants to help. Um, within region, I think it's interesting to note so that the threat report has some different statistics that are useful. One of the things that it calls out is looking globally at countries that are particularly highly targeted. Two of those countries were Sudan and Libya. 
both of them driven largely by foreign interference operations, particularly coming from Iran and from Russia. Um, and then the other thing to think about as we think about this space is that there are broadly two types of threat actors and the way they are evolving is different and the threat that they pose is different. First, I think there's a relatively small set of let's call them veterans. These tend to be government backed, particularly Russian and Iranian actors that have been trying to do this for years and that we have seen their tactics evolve aggressively in response to the defenses that governments, civil society and the platforms have put in place. Generally over time, they are and their operations, what we have seen is that they're reaching fewer people, they're getting caught sooner and they're having less impact. We're seeing them get pushed off the major platforms and moving to the internet where they can survive a bit longer. But as a result of that, because they're not getting access to the audiences on the platforms, they're, they're having less impact from these operations. The second community that's important are new players, new people getting into the field, testing out these techniques. They are much less sophisticated, but they are targeting public debate in places where there isn't as much focus. And we're seeing more and more actors try to get into the conversation. Two specific threat trends that I think are worth calling out in uh, the Middle East, as well as globally, is first deception for hire. And a couple of people have mentioned this, but I think it's a really important point to highlight. We have seen a significant growth in recent years of PR and marketing firms that are essentially selling deceptive influence as a service. And um, one of the earliest ones that we saw actually was a group called Archimedes Group operating out of Israel, working across the Middle East and Africa on pay of different politicians. But we're seeing more and more marketing firms trying to do this. And what's significant about this is two things. First, it allows people to further launder their identity. So if you want to hire a firm and you pay them off of the platform so we can't see that link, you can conceal and put multiple layers behind who's behind an operation so we won't be able to expose that and other investigators will have a much harder time. And second is it makes these techniques much more available to far more people. You don't need to build a team of trolls to do this. You can just hire someone as long as you have money. And then the second technique that I think is really interesting and worth calling out because it plays with a lot of the things we've talked about here is hiring locals. We see particularly Russian actors increasingly trying to hire locals, especially across Africa, to run these operations for them. And I think the insight would be here, one, that makes it potentially harder to find these operations. And two, we were talking about how you want these narratives to be well targeted to public debate. Locals are going to understand what's happening within their country better, and they're going to be able to target the narratives more effectively. So these are two trends that we're seeing um, across the world, but certainly influencing MENA in particular. And so I, there's a lot more that I could say here, but what I wanted to do to start was to give sort of that frame of the different types of threats, direct hacking, overt influence operations, and covert influence operations, and then talk about some of the insights we've seen from the 2017 to 2020 threat report. Happy to answer more questions and looking forward to Q&A. Great, wow, that was just tremendous. Uh, thank you all so much. This was really fascinating. I'd like to get a conversation going now. Um, so I'm gonna pose a few questions and give you each a, a chance to respond. Renee, for obvious reasons, I'm gonna start with you. I wanna get your voice in this. Uh, and before we get to more specific questions from the audience, and if you do wanna pose a, a question, please uh, click on the Q&A button to do that. I'd like to um, first give you a chance, each of you, uh, to uh, comment on or uh, engage one another with any issues or questions that you would like to pose. Second, I'd like to ask our scholars specifically, um, uh, what data needs would you like to see filled from the platform, I'll say from the platforms, plural, um, that you think are not being adequately filled now? Is there more data sharing that would be useful to you as scholars uh, to get at this problem? Uh, and then third, I've got more questions, but I'll leave it at this for now and I'll just kind of do a round robin here. Um, 
what can uh, we talked about the platforms a lot and nathaniel thank you for going into so much detail on this it's really valuable and interesting what can democratic governments do uh, in two respects number one to push back and number two to model good behavior or should we just forget about modeling good behavior and get in the swamp and fight filth with filth and uh opaqueness with opaqueness. I don't think anybody's going to be in favor of that, but um, we'll uh, go to Renee first, uh, and then we'll revert to the order, and Nathaniel will we'll come to you last. Go ahead, Renee. Thank you. Um, one thing I really appreciated about our panel here is the breadth of types of uh, mis and disinformation that were covered, right? And, and so one of the things that we've tried to do at SIO is, is um, when we're looking at an operation, whether it's from a takedown or from proactive work that we're doing, trying to understand the spread of a narrative, we believe that it's important to evaluate along a spectrum of overt to covert and the broadcast to social um, ecosystem, recognizing that there are facets, uh, that this is no longer a social media covert problem, but as, uh, as Alex's paper elucidated, the link, <clears throat> excuse me, the link between broadcast and social media, even in the presence of state actors, state media properties on social media really provides a fascinating link. Um, ways in which audience reach and growth, uh, you know, is facilitated on social, but also with the intent to drive people to broadcast properties as well. Um, the spectrum of operation types from persuasion and, uh, and attempts to, uh, to shape public perception of an issue, which is the kind of stuff that, uh, that Shelby and I covered in some of the operations that we see uh, stemming from Saudi Arabia and, um, and Egypt in particular, versus the work to distract and to make it too complicated to figure out what is true, right? That other side of it um, that we saw so well represented in the studies uh, on, on Turkey. And so we have this, um, this spectrum of operations and this ties into your question about data, which is how do we understand this in any kind of holistic way? And I think that's where as our team works, you know, we use a bunch of different tools. We, we build our own for, for gathering where we can. Uh, we work with the platforms again where we can. I think some of the things that we are still lacking is the understanding of impact. Um, and you know, we can we can see engagements, but that's not necessarily a proxy for impact, particularly since uh, you know, on some of the state media pages, oftentimes it looks like those are not necessarily the most real of actors engaging with the content. You know, there are click farms and things that are that are participating in, in some of the uh, kind of juicing engagement numbers to make them look bigger or more impressive than they are. Uh, in some of the networks that Shelby presented on, there are amplifier accounts who are in there to hit the retweet button, to hit the like button, to make it look like those engagements are, uh, are showing, a, you know, a significant impact or reach when in reality they're not. And so I think the data, one of the, the types of data that we really lack are the, the questions of, when this content, when these prompts are, these nudges are put in front of the public, what is the response? How do actors react? Do they follow the account? We don't know. You know, <laughs> do they, when a recommendation is suggested for a state media, you know, for a state media piece, uh, what's the engagement with it like? We don't know. We can see ads. There's some visibility into that through the ads, the ads tool on Facebook, but for uh, engagement with organic content, we, we really don't know who's engaging with a lot of this stuff. And that I think, uh, creates a bit of a vacuum in our understanding of the problem. Um, as far as what can net, what can democratic governments do, I would say we're at a point where you know misinformation is networked, but addressing it is not. And we've tried to build some of that infrastructure um, in the context of the work we've done on the election integrity partnership, now the virality project, trying to say, are there ways for us to work using the signals that we all have in the focus areas that we all um, pay attention to? and to create those information conduits so that democratic governments can participate in the countering or the uh, or, you know, or identifying that an operation is occurring more rapidly so that it's not solely the purview of tech platforms to decide what to leave up and take down. Again, with that question of, of, um, of impact, it's possible that certain communities might need to hear from civil society or a democratic government to counter some of these claims, but we don't really have visibility into that yet. So I would say that on the, you know, what can democratic governments do? Um, there's the question of, if this is significantly impactful, how do we want to contextualize that in terms of responses? Losing your social media accounts shouldn't be the only thing that happens if, if we're finding that this is a particularly impactful phenomenon. Um, but right now, I would say, 
even just the mode for detecting and countering is a little bit ad hoc and haphazard and uh, you know, Western governments could stand to improve on that. Okay, great. Uh, let's go to Alexandra next. Great, thank you all for these wonderful presentations. And I think Renee did a really fantastic job of kind of synthesizing a lot of the open questions and challenges that remain. Something that I wanted to raise that I think comes up to a differing degree across all of our talks is this question of how do we determine who the target of certain types of campaigns are. And this is actually something that is most challenging or more challenging in the Middle East than it is in some other contexts because Arabic is widely used across multiple countries. And so that makes it extremely difficult to determine, for example, like Shelby was mentioning in her talk, if there is a Saudi disinformation campaign, to what extent is the target audience outside of Saudi Arabia or a domestic audience or some combination of the two. Uh, Chris Berry and I have done a little work trying to distinguish this by looking into um, what topics are focused on by different types of um, influence campaigns that have been identified and taken down by the platforms. But I think that that's something that we still don't have a lot of leverage on and I think is important for trying to assess the, the impact and the exact kind of policy problems that arise from different types of campaigns. Um, on the data side, I want to echo what Renee said. When we think about engagement, this is really only a small part of impact and it's what we can easily get numbers on and data about as, as researchers, but most people are not sharing or commenting on or liking content that's coming across their platforms. People lurk on online platforms to try to gain information without even following particular accounts. And so I think, you know, platforms track these metrics in different ways. Things that you see, like when you run an ad, there are reach metrics or impressions metrics for how often is this content at least coming across someone's timeline, whether on Facebook or Twitter. But I think understanding um, exposure to content is, is something really challenging for researchers that are not working with the platforms directly. We don't really have a way of um, measuring that. And then a final challenge that I, that I want to kind of emphasize, which I think has come up to differing degrees in these presentations is, and this, and this actually has emerged on um, kind of other iterations of this conference. I think Marco and Jones talked about this in, in his work as well is that as strategies change our ability to identify inauthentic behavior of various types becomes a lot more challenging. And so even for me, when I with the paper I'm presenting, when I say these accounts have large numbers of followers, well, to what degree are their followers authentic or inauthentic? And I've tried to get at this both with automated kind of bot detection and qualitatively looking at accounts, but it's really challenging. And the existing tools, I think, don't perform very well in Arabic or in non-English language. So I think um, kind of collectively as the research community and people at the platforms having kind of a better sense of best practices for identifying a wider range of these types of accounts and sort of combining our knowledge and approaches is another place where there's a lot of room for growth. So thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Akin. Well, thank you so much. Um, so data needs. Um, I think the recent um, academic API, which is going to come up, will be really, really useful for us because um, I'm also teaching the um, Summer Institute in Computational Social Science in Istanbul. And we're not only um, having participants from Turkey, but also the entire Middle East and North Africa region and Eastern Europe. And um, one of the things that come up very regularly is that we work with Twitter data so dominantly that, um, you know, how can we use um, you know, Facebook data um, in a way that is, um, that I mean, published in an academic paper or that's something that um, happens within um, the community guidelines and data extraction rules of Facebook. That has been something that has been coming up very regularly. And I'm very happy that that academic API is coming along. That solves 90% of our problems. 
Um, and uh, you know, what can democratic governments do? I'd like to you know separate this into two. What can democratic and highly polarized go, you know, countries do, and democratic and not that much polarized uh, governments can do? Because one of um, the problems that we have uh, with our project with Turkish fact-checking organizations is how to um, make fact-checking work in Turkish context with which excessively polarized uh, about anything that happens. So uh, in those kinds of excessive, excessively polarized um, spaces, even non-political things that are about you know, popular culture, that polarizes things uh, immediately once and for all. Um, and um, even if fact-checking performance is excellent, um, if the kind of disinformation is um, skillful in the sense that it understands the culture and it understands the political context, um, no amount of fact-checking uh, ends up uh, correcting those. And that happens during protest periods, when there's a terrorist attack, when there are elections, when people really don't want to listen, actually, um, when they're being fact-checked or when they're being corrected. So what can democratic governments that aren't that polarized, um, data literacy programs, the Finland model, which works really, really well, but um, what can governments um, that are highly polarized um, do about disinformation? Frankly, I don't know. Uh, and, um, you know, based on my research, not just like Russian disinformation, but also domestic disinformation that happens in Turkey, if the type of disinformation or the inf influence operation is very skilled, uh, which means that it understands the political context and cultural context, uh, even if fact-checking is very good, um, if disinformation gets spread out uh, much, much more frequently and you know, largely than um, the fact-checking attempt. So I'm a bit pessimistic about what polarized democratic governments can do about disinformation. Yeah, well, uh, look, we're struggling with this in the United States. It's hardly just a Middle Eastern or emerging market uh, area. A uh, problem, Shelby? Um, yeah, I'll just talk about maybe two things I don't think have been mentioned. So first in terms of what democracies can do. So I think about a year ago, Facebook uh, identified and suspended an operation that was attributed to an American PR firm that was working on behalf of the Bolivian government. And my team helped to analyze that report along with the FR lab. And uh, the PR firm had in fact registered as a uh, foreign agent of the Bolivian government with the Department of Justice as they were supposed to. Um, and so I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that because they did that, they, even though they had created these, these inauthentic uh, Facebook accounts, they didn't really get in any trouble for this beyond just having their Facebook presence suspended. So I don't really know what I'm advocating, but it kind of feels like something else should have happened to that, to that PR firm um, for, you know, creating these, these inauthentic accounts that were covertly like uh, meddling in Bolivia's affairs. Um, and then the second thing I'll just say on, on data access is, um, so Facebook has this really cool feature called page transparency that will show you if Facebook pages have changed their names. Um, and so increasingly we'll see like a page that was originally called like Libya humor and then became a more kind of political page. Um, and the, the humorous you know, content was designed to just like build audiences. And so that information is really helpful. Um, but at the moment you actually can't get that information from, from Twitter. You can't see if an account in any easy way, if an account has, has changed their name. So it'd be really cool if like in the Twitter API, they could include like what the name of the account was at the time of a, of a certain tweet. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, well, uh, Nathaniel, there's uh, a lot on the table. Uh, some of it uh, involves um, platform policies. I think uh, we could talk a lot more about government policies and maybe you could put your prior hat on for a minute in thinking about hmm. that. And then if you wanna respond at all to what more kind of cooperation and data sharing might be possible, um, Obviously, this is, is not your specific role at Facebook, but in any way, over to you. Sure. Um, yeah, there, that, there was a lot of very useful meat in all of those comments. I don't think I'm going to get to engage with all of it, but a few things to pull out. It's interesting, just one place to start. Shelby, your point about the page transparency is interesting. 
We developed that because we saw that there was this systemic way in which malicious actors, governments and non-governments, plenty of financially motivated actors would do exactly this. They'd create a page around like fuzzy kittens and friendly puppies, and they would build an audience and then they'd switch it to some divisive political issue. And that was a tactic we saw repeated. One of the things I think we try to do is when we see a tactic like that, we ask the question, is there a way we can change the product itself to just make this tactic less effective? And so one, it's interesting, we're talking about data asked from the platforms and I'll switch to that in a minute. But one thing that I would say actually in the other direction, one of the lessons I think we've learned is that we have teams that are incredibly expert at seeing manipulation of our platforms. We don't see everything um, and we never will. If you look at the major takedowns I mentioned, more than 150 of them, about two thirds are based on our own investigations and about one third are based on tips and insights shared by external organizations, including the Stanford Center and others around the world, both government and non-government. And so insights into specific operations, but also trending tactics that people are seeing is incredibly valuable to my team because one of our key roles is connecting this insight that if we see this tactic happening, we don't just wanna sit there and keep doing whack-a-mole. We wanna actually change the platform to make it less effective. And so understanding that is incredibly valuable. In terms of data shared back out, um, <clears throat> I think this is an incredible vice that uh, as in like, we're all getting squeezed in this. We are trying in many ways to share data. We're constrained in a lot of ways. For the conversation, one thing that I would say that's incredibly helpful is as we think about transparency, there are a few different kinds of transparency and scoping the conversation in that way can be really useful. There's content transparency, actually sharing the contents of an operation, which is probably the hardest. There's data transparency or statistical transparency, sharing stats about like what I what like what was mentioned around engagement, what you mentioned, Renee, or other activity. There is um, policy transparency, which is sharing clear statements of not just what our policies are, but what the basis for each enforcement action is. And then there's analytic transparency, which is sharing an analytic understanding of the behaviors we're seeing, the trends, the tactics, and how these actors are engaging. Um, each of these I think is useful in different situations and for different types of threats. And so understanding which of those people are asking for and then specifically what within them is very helpful. Um, I won't promise we're able to share it. I think we've tried to share a lot of things and have been unsuccessful because of legal constraints um, and other barriers, but I think we've been pushing to share more and more. And one of the foundational principles of my team in particular has been the more we can share data publicly, the more we're able to move the needle on security threats, because instead of just the eyeballs at Facebook, you get all of these other teams focused on the challenge. Um, on the question of democratic governments, I think it's a really, really important one and a very good one. Um, I don't know whether this is my current hat or my former or, or my former hat, Larry, but I'd say two things. The first is very simple, and it is uh, legislative frameworks and normative frameworks that provide clarity and consistency around some of the lines in this context. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, there are a lot. There, what we've seen over the past couple of years is a shift towards blurrier and blurrier tactics. I think everyone generally agrees running a network of fake accounts that don't represent real people that are designed to look like they're from Kansas when they're actually being controlled from St. Petersburg isn't, isn't okay. Even there, there's some, some blurry lines around it, but generally people agree on that. Most of the tactics we're seeing today don't look like that. And there are real important questions, particularly in the domestic context of where we should draw these lines. A simple example, in the offline world, political campaigns in the United States hire people to knock on doors all the time. When someone shows up at your door and knocks, they don't necessarily say, hi, I'm being paid by the campaign versus I'm a volunteer. If a campaign hires a thousand people to use their real accounts to amplify the campaign's message, should those accounts have to disclose that they're being paid? I, I don't know. Um, and I think you can make arguments this is the same as door knocking, and so they shouldn't have to. And you can make arguments that the nature of the volume and the interaction is such that the lines should change. I think there are a bunch of questions like this in the domestic and the foreign space. And until we have clarity around them, it's incredibly hard to make progress on the problem. That's one way that legislation can be really helpful. Another thing that uh, it, just this point about deterrence is I think extremely important. We do everything we can to deter these actors, but at the end of the day, it's mostly deterrence by denial. If you want to actually impose cost 
you need to have government action to facilitate that. And we've seen some steps in the US and elsewhere, but I think more structure would be valuable. And the last piece that's really critical, I think, and one of the most important reasons why legislation is important, it's worth noting actually, late last year, my team put out a list of some recommendations for ways we thought legislation could be helpful from democratic governments on countering influence operations. So there's some ideas there, but at its core, if democratic governments don't define the rules of engagement around public debate, there are plenty of other governments that are very happy to define them and that are moving into the breach very quickly. The places where we're seeing legislation move is not in democratic governments. We're seeing legislation move in other places. And as the more that gets passed, the more that gets defined, the harder it is to establish the sort of public debate framework we're all talking about. And so I think that's a, one of the biggest reasons why legislation is so important to move in democratic contexts. And then the second piece that's really important for governments, here this definitely is with my current hat, um, is one of the trends we're seeing around the world is increasingly sort of autocratic or autocratic-like regimes pushing social media platforms to take things down, to take actions in certain ways. And people often think about the power of social media platforms, but we need to remember that to the extent that there is power there, it is very diffuse. And a government within its bounds is always going to be more powerful. I think that's by design and should be the case. But what it means is if an autocratic regime is pressing on social media platforms to take action, it is going to be extremely hard for the platforms to resist on their own. Democratic governments sending clear signals of where these bounds are and why this is so important is a really important component in maintaining the public boundaries we have. It's really interesting, and here's a direct connection point that I'll just offer. People often talk about the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which governs who can access data and when, as a fairly outdated um, piece, of, uh, piece of legislation that needs to be updated, but one of the things that it does is it sets clear boundaries about who can be who can share data with whom and when, which is a really important line around the world. And that is a legislative step taken from a democratic government that has secondary consequences around the world, some good and some bad. But in this context, I think it does help protect public debate. So that was a few answers. The last thing that I will note, just because we were talking about the link and connection between broadcast and social, I do think as we're all thinking about how to tackle this problem, I think it is really important to highlight that it is not just a multi-platform challenge, but many of these operations, they're designed to ultimately target broadcast media and use social media as a lever to get there. And the biggest impact comes when you get on the front page of whatever the sort of public newspaper is and the broadcast TV is. And so we see these links and we've actually started to see threat actors, the Iranians are a good example, trying to just jump right to that where they will directly target journalists to try to get them to write their stories for them. They will create fake identities that will then get letters to the editor um, and, and op-eds published in legitimate newspapers under false identities, trying to push their narrative. So we're seeing that. So we have to remember as we're tackling this, the internet is a big and important piece of this, but it's the entire media ecosystem that I think is getting challenged. Okay, thank you so much. That was a very uh, rich uh, set of responses. Um, I'm now going to uh, go to one last round here and we'll need your responses to be very concise, not only because we've promised to finish by 1030, but because I have to teach a class at 1030. So um, uh, if you'd each take about a minute uh, or so uh, to respond to any of these uh, issues I want to raise in conclusion. Um, one is uh, about overt propaganda. Someone asked, is, since it's overt and it's really just propaganda out there in the world, do we really need to worry about it? Someone had asked earlier, and then I guess it was answered and, and it disappeared. What about the overt broadcasting, call it propaganda or call it information of the democracies, the BBC, the Voice of America and so on? Um, is there any, uh, are they doing any good at pushing back? Um, I wouldn't put them in the same category as RT, but do you, do you see any scope there for better information uh, to crowd out bad information? And um, is societal response in that regard uh, enough? Uh, 
I wanted to ask about Tunisia. If anyone wants to say anything about this, no one, this hasn't come up. It's the only democracy in the Arab world. And it is not a democracy that Egypt, Saudi Arabia, or any of these other authoritarian actors want to succeed. And my understanding is it's been targeted in some pretty relentless ways because they don't want it to succeed. Um, and then finally, any other thoughts you have um, on what you'd like to see uh, the US and other democratic governments do, including possibly more robust regulation of the activities of these interme corporate intermediaries, including the PR and marketing firms. So 60 to 90 seconds or so, Renee, start with you. Sure, I'll tackle um, point one over propaganda. So we've got some work coming out on this, actually looking at RT and its um, and the way that overt the, the pantheon of Russian state media properties targeting the US um, are have been messaging around uh, civil rights um, civil rights protests in the U.S. and I think it's really important to note that the overt capability it, it is attributable and so those who know what it is um, may at least have some sense of where the message is coming from and what the incentives are behind that message uh, it's it's not totally clear not all of them have names as obvious as RT right there's a there's a number a huge range in the now for example um, of these other properties that are state affiliated that don't clearly articulate who they are and but for the platforms labeling them which actually precipitated some lawsuits uh, it, it was actually quite hard to to find that that was a uh, an overt property despite the fact that it wasn't actively concealed in the way that a gray or black propaganda property would be um, so there are some, some interesting dynamics uh, around that. Again, this gets back to the question of, of impact and audience. But what we've seen also is that overt propaganda embeds content from covert operations. Uh, Russia did it with the Internet Research Agency. They did it with the GRU hack material. Uh, they've done it with, you know, Prigozhin's paper RIA fan regularly is embedding content from information operations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so you, there is no distinct, again, this is why I said when we do our investigations, we look for that overt to covert broadcast to social spectrum and, and, and evaluate okay. in those four quadrants. Great. Uh, Alexandra? So as, as you, Larry, rightly mentioned, right, this is not only the purview of authoritarian regimes and the kind of early examples of this, right, date back to the Cold War with Radio Free Europe and even earlier than that. So this is, this is not new and it's not limited, of course, to authoritarian regimes. In regard to your question of, you know, could Western sources like BBC or trying to do the same thing be effective. What Megan Metzger and I found in our research looking at RT during the Syria conflict is that mainstream um, Western news outlets are actually not very good at getting their content spread around on social media. And this is because they do things like use hashtag news which nobody would search for rather than, you know, <laughs> linking, linking to you kind of the, the types of content that's more likely to go viral and get attention, right? Like they use hashtags less often overall and the ones they use aren't, aren't very effective for getting their content to be seen. And that's very much in contrast to a platform like R or to a um, broadcaster like RT, which tries to, um, you know, insert itself into trending hashtags and, and get itself seen um, more effectively. So part of it is, you know, the, the strategies are different across um, the different outlets and a lot of the um, a lot of the outlets that happen to be coming out of authoritarian regimes are better at kind of getting themselves seen in the online space. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention when you're talking about sort of regulation or, or thinking about solutions is that it's very much a politicized and political question of what should be labeled um, in, in terms of any form of content moderation. And so an interesting development we've seen in the Arab world is countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE incorporating language into their anti-cyber crime laws, which are used to um, repress dissidents and, and kind of contain all sorts of content, which they wouldn't like to uh, see it propagating online by labeling it things like fake news or hate speech, you know, taking the labels that are showing up in debates over regulation in the US and twisting it for the purpose of repressing information. So 
it, that adds another layer to this challenge because the goals of different actors in this space are quite different. Okay, Akin. Yeah, I'm really fascinated by how different countries uh, try to solve this disinformation problem very differently, and especially um, countries, you know, democratic countries that aren't that much polarized. Um, they don't really care about battling disinformation because they think that it doesn't have any effect, actual effect on the information ecosystem. I think countries that care about this information a lot are countries that are already very polarized. And um, the information operation that is being conducted has a tangible domestic effect on um, that country's ecosystem. For example, um, you mentioned Tunisia. We um, Last year, we had a Tunisian um, student, I don't, I don't want to name names, but um, a senior person um, who was, you know, handling digital policy in um, Tunisia, and we discussed this, you know, huge Gulf origin disinformation issue with them. And basically, what he said was, "Who cares? Like nobody actually consumes that kind of disinformation domestically, so we don't really have an incentive um, to do much about that. It's basically kind of like a Gulf thing, and it makes them look bad, and it doesn't have domestic effect in Tunisia that much." So why should I spend like millions and millions of dollars into fact checking or automated like content moderation to make it go away? I, it's a waste of resource. Mm -hmm. It's a very fascinating way of looking at it. And when I looked at, um, uh, you know, uh, countries like Sweden, Switzerland, or even like Italy, it's polarized. Yes, but it's it's kind of like um, some countries don't really care. And it really fascinates me. Uh, they don't really want to do that much about battling disinformation. Um, and about corporate intermediaries, I think a similar situation um, is, is quite valid, it would be corporate, especially in this part of the world, like Middle East and North Africa. Um, some companies in like Netherlands, Great Britain, even Germany, Sweden, and from California, uh, they help these governments um, do some of those like inauthentic uh, work for them. And another part of the government in all of those countries um, hire another group of countries to battle with the disinformation that comes from, uh, you know, other countries. So uh, it, it becomes um, a very interesting kind of uh, battle between um, different companies that are uh, doing it and uh, okay. the country. Also, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, Shelby. Thank you for your generosity. Since we're over time and uh, offering to uh, have us move on, because we do need to close. But Nathaniel, I'll give you the the last words. That's very dangerous. Um, okay, I will just say quickly a couple of things that I think came out in this conversation. Um, I, I think you were asking Larry about authentic information. And I do think that's actually a really important component of this discussion. But as many things go, I think the medium is the message here. So from a Facebook perspective, one of the things that we have found extremely important around elections and around, for example, health misinformation is how do we amplify accurate information for the public? But the truth is, particularly in polarized societies, the voice that is doing the amplification is almost as important as the message when you assess how people will respond. So we can't do it directly. What we have tried to do is to identify respected independent voices that can be amplified. And it's interesting here, when you think about uh, democratic governments, platforms and civil society, one of the most critical roles of civil society voices is the ability to be one of those trusted voices. Let's be honest, governments are not always the most trusted. I wouldn't say that platforms are always the most trusted either. Having that, al that alternative authority is extremely important. Um, and so I think that's one way in which we think about how do you amplify authentic information and how can it be useful and most effective. There are lots of ways that we've touched on that I think regulation could be valuable here. Um, but I think we've touched on a lot of them. I think there are interesting ways that we can see regulation around PR firms. And given the growth in that space, I think that's a particularly important area to think about because we're going to see more of that. Um, there's a lot more to say. But uh, I will sort of leave it there in deference to your class that you're already late to, Larry. I will say there were a couple of questions in the Q&A written about how we label and who we choose to label. And I would just note that there's a Help Center uh, article that details sort of the bases for whether we determine someone is editorially independent or not. It doesn't go into every detail, but it shows the key factors. Um, and I'll put that into the chat here so people can take a look at it.
Great, and we can also give uh, visibility to it. Uh, Shelby, thank you for your observation that we should pay more attention to influence operations in Tunisia. I do have to close now in part because I've got to give a lecture to a class. Um, I wanna thank again my, first of all, I wanna thank the amazing presenters uh, here today, uh, Alexandra, Aachen, uh, Shelby, uh, Renee, and Nathaniel. This has really just been a fantastic conclusion to this wonderful four-part uh, conference. I wanna thank my colleagues in this project and GDPI, Eileen Donahoe and uh, Tracy Nabuchoke uh, in the uh, program on Arab reform and democracy at FSI, Hish Hisham Salam, uh, at POMEPS, uh, Mark Lynch and Tessa uh, Talabi, uh, and all of you who've joined us uh, for these four sessions. Thank you all so much. We look forward to publishing these papers and we look forward to continuing the dialogue. And uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Okay.